Believe in yourself, cause it starts with you And then everyone else will believe you too And if it looks like you're the only believer around Just keep on believing, don't put yourself down Just believe Our guest this week grew up in San Pedro, California Earned a BA in political science from Duke University And was a four-year starter for Coach K and Duke basketball He later earned a law degree from Duke Law School. Drafted by the Dallas Mavericks, he played professionally in Italy and Spain from 1986 to 89. And since 1995, he's been a color commentator and studio analyst for ESPN. A longtime champion for student athletic payment. And the most respected voice in college basketball today, his name, Jay Billis. And I'm Jack Crisula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. I'm Jack Grisula. This is Anything is Possible, and we're talking to Jay Billis, the most respected voice in college basketball today. Jay, welcome and honor to have you. Well, it's an honor for me to be with you, Jack. Thank you for having me. Can we start by talking about your childhood and your mom and your dad, please? Sure. Uh, you know, I grew up in a town called Rolling Hills, California. I was born in San Pedro, California, near the Port of Los Angeles. And my dad and mom both grew up in that town, San Pedro. Uh, my father uh, is of Yugoslav descent. Uh, he was born in the United States, but didn't speak English till he went to school uh, as a youngster. And, uh, and he really worked his whole life. He never really got to play organized sports like I did, even though he was a really good athlete. Um, but he, he, was a, he was a commercial fisherman from his early teens into his uh, early 20s, I believe, and then uh, got into the electronics business and had his own uh, television uh, repair and sales uh, shops. Uh, he had two of them. And uh, my mother um, you know, went to San Pedro High School. Uh, she, was, uh, you know, she chose to stay at home and raise four kids. And uh, you know they say you can't choose your parents, but uh, but I was I was pretty lucky that uh, that you know they chose me. So it was, a, it was I had a really nice childhood. Older brother who was a outstanding golfer and great athlete, seven years older, who was my idol uh, growing up and and still is. And uh, two younger sisters, uh, both of whom are lawyers. And my youngest sister is uh, the best at everything in our family: best athlete, best lawyer, smartest. Uh, so, you know, I, I probably get the most attention because of, of television, uh, but she's by far the most accomplished. All right. You were pretty accomplished. You were a consensus top 50 recruit coming out of high school. You averaged 24 points, 13 and a half rebounds. You could, a lot of schools were after you. And you go across the country to the school named Duke University. And the previous two years, Jay, 80-81, they were 17 and 13. 81, 82, they were 10 and 17. Why did you go to Duke? Well, the simple answer, Jack, is Coach K. Uh, I, when he first called me, uh, I think Duke had seen me play in an all-star event during the summertime in Utah. Uh, and I started getting phone calls from, from Duke. And honestly, I didn't know where Duke was. I knew it was on the East Coast. I knew they were in the ACC, but I didn't know it was in the state of North Carolina or Durham or Chapel Hill. I didn't know any, where any of those things were growing up in Los Angeles. This was pre-internet. We did have maps available, but I wasn't, I wasn't looking at those with regard to where schools were located. And, uh, and so Coach K, among the, the coaches I came down to, um, he was the, the least well-known. And, uh, and the truth is, I didn't, I didn't know his name when he first called. I had never heard of him. And I'm sure he had never heard of me before that tournament in Utah. But um, I just honestly, I liked him the best. He was the, the coach I trusted the most. It wasn't that I didn't trust the others and I didn't love the others because I think I would have loved playing for a number of different, different coaches. But uh, I just knew. And, uh, and it had nothing to do with Duke. Uh, it had nothing to do with the ACC versus the Big Ten or the Big East where, or, or, or the Big Eight at the time with the other schools I was looking at. It really came down to uh, I liked him and I wanted to play for him. And uh, it turned out it was a really good decision, although at the time I just didn't realize how profound uh, of, a, uh, of a decision it would be on, on my life uh, because you know saying yes to Coach K – 
uh, changed my life, and and it changed the, tra- the trajectory of it. And honestly, Jack, I I, uh, I don't see, say this um, flippantly. I honestly don't know where I'd be right now <clears throat> if it weren't for Coach Day. I, I have no idea. I mean, I, I don't think I'd be, you know, selling pencils on the street and destitute. But uh, my, my life's path would have been significantly different. For the last 30 years, arguably, he was the modern John Wooden. What made him so unique and successful? You know, it's, I get that asked that question quite a bit, and I don't know uh, how to put it into words, but I'll try. Um, on the basketball side, he's as good as there's ever been. He's intensely competitive, and uh, uh, he's got a wonderful feel for the game and feel for people and how to put combinations together and how to reach people on a human level. So it's less about X's and O's and more about how he grabs your heart. And uh, he, I don't, I don't consider him you know, a motivator. I, I think he, he finds a way to inspire uh, but I think one of the separators for me with Coach K was how uh, invested he was in in me off the court. I would not have gone to law school if it weren't for Coach K. Uh, I would not have gotten into coaching if it weren't for Coach K. Um, he greased the skids for me to get into broadcasting. Um, you know, when I was in high school and became a, a recognized player, you know, you get interviewed and, you know, newspapers do articles on you, things like that. And the question you got back then, or at least I got, was what do you want to do after basketball? And the truth is, at 17 years old, I didn't know. And at that time, uh, this is back in the early 1980s, late 70s, uh, there were some former athletes that were getting into broadcasting, whether it was Frank Gifford or Don Drysdale or the like, Don Meredith. And so I, I, I thought, well, maybe broadcasting. And so I said that in some of these interviews, and Coach K read it. All the coaches did, and uh, and he said, "How do we make this happen?" And he introduced me to a guy named Chuck Howard, who was a, a senior executive at ABC Sports. And I started working for ABC during the summer, and uh, I did it every summer while I was in college. And if were it not for that, I don't think uh, I would have established relationships in the business, and I don't think I would have gotten into it. Honestly, maybe, but I doubt it. And uh, and he was very in tune with this is what this player wants to do. Um, I was more than just a, a, a uniform to him, and all of his players were and are. Uh, and it was a, it's been a lifelong relationship that uh, that never stopped after I stopped playing at Duke. And uh, and that's I'm not sure I could say that's unique because he's not the only one that does that. But uh, And then I had the benefit, frankly, of the fact that he stayed there for 40 years. And so my relationship with the university, with all my former teammates and guys that played after, after us, uh, has been significantly different than it would have been had he chosen to go to the NBA or leave for another, another job somewhere. We're talking to Jay Billis. Went to Duke. 15 miles down the road was his school, University of North Carolina, and they would have pickup games. And there was a guy on that team by the name of Michael Jordan. When we come back, we're going to talk about pickup games against Michael. And I'm Jack Prisula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. I'm Jack Prisula. This is Anything is Possible. We're talking to Jay Billis, affectionately known as the Billistrator. Jay, you had pickup games regularly against University of North Carolina. So it was Coach K against Dean Smith. And they had phenomenal players. One of them was this man or kid named Michael Jordan. How good was he? We knew right away. Uh, So Jordan was a sophomore when we got to Duke. And those pickup games, we would play, it was preseason, so we would play one, you know, a week uh, we would go to Chapel Hill. Maybe the next week they'd come to Durham, and you know we'd share the you know, the the travel burden, if you wanted to call it that. So it was player driven. The coaches weren't involved in it. Uh, some of the players knew one another, and we all got to know one another through those games. And uh, the first time we played, we hadn't even played a college game, and went over to Chapel Hill, and that was the first time I saw him in person. I had watched him play in the NCAA tournament the year before, uh, but didn't really know much about him I you know obviously he hit the shot to beat Georgetown uh, in the championship game in 1982 
but it's not like I knew his game or knew his reputation beyond uh, that tournament. You know, this is pre-internet, so you know you didn't know as much about national players as you do now. And uh, from the first pickup game, we knew this guy's different. Like there, there's, there's. Uh, I, I don't know how to couch it, Jack, but uh, I remember like reading when I was a kid about Mickey Mantle, and other players would say that the ball made a different sound when it came off of Mantle's bat. Just this thing that players know, and you knew playing against Jordan, watching him, like n- nobody else can do this, and or or if somebody else can, it's a very small class. So when people ask now, did you guys know Jordan was going to be great? The answer is yes. Now at, at teenage years, could I have processed that we're playing against the the someone who's going to be considered the greatest player of all time? We, we probably didn't take it to that level, but. Yeah, we knew he's going to be an NBA All Star perennially and Hall of Famer. Um, uh, there, there was just the athleticism, the competitive nature. Um, you know, when he left the floor and you left the floor, I, I don't know that the law of physics is suspended for any player. But if if it ever was, like, you know, I think his hang time was just because he jumped higher and it took him longer to come down. But uh, it was absurd, the things that he could do in the air. And uh, uh, we knew. We knew right away. Speaking of championships games, let's move ahead to April 1986, Dallas, Texas. You're in the championship. Your senior year, Duke against Louisville. You had 37 wins. Still the NCAA record for most wins in a single season. Talk about that championship game. You know, it's probably, Jack, the most uh, affecting and frustrating loss of of my lifetime in anything. And, uh, you know, when you're that close to winning and you believe, and, uh, you know, honestly, not not to take anything away from Louisville because they were great, but we still think we were the better team. And we shot the ball so poorly, uh, you know, open shots that we would normally make. And uh, I think Louisville shot over 50%, and we shot in the 30s, and we lost by a bucket. And uh, had we won that game, I think not only would we have won a championship, which is all we cared about, but, you know, we were being talked about that weekend of the Final Four as where, where did that, that team fit in among the greatest teams of all time. And, you know, you don't win that game, and, and all that discussion goes away. And uh, so it, it, to be that close and lose, you know, we had lost in the NCAA tournament the two years before, but we weren't the best team. Uh, and so th- for some reason, those losses don't stick out. The, uh, every loss is painful. But that one, when it's right on your fingertips and you don't close it out, um, you know, it, it, I, it, that's why every year when I cover the Final Four, my eyes tend to go toward the losing team at the end because I know the feeling. And uh, as a player, I, I don't know if, if Coach K or Tom Izzo would agree with this. They've been there so many times. But when you um, – it's different for a player and a coach. Uh, when you lose as a coach, you have more opportunities. When you lose as a player, that was our last last opportunity. You have so few opportunities that I think it sticks with you uh, longer and, uh, and in a deeper way. So um, to be that close, and, and but, but at the same time, uh, I wouldn't trade that experience we had for anything. Um, you know, the guys I played with are my best friends. And uh, I don't think I've been with any any group of people, colleagues, uh, classmates, teammates in other sports that I've developed that kind of bond with. And uh, I, it, sports is unique in that, that way. Uh, there may be, look, I can't compare it to that. I've never served in the military or anything like that. But um, I'm as close with those guys and, and the staff uh, as any, any group of people I've ever been around. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. We're talking to Jay Billis, 1986 NBA draft. He went in the fifth round, the 108th person overall to the Dallas Mavericks, and then played in Italy and Spain. Let's move forward to 1989, and Coach K says, come be an assistant coach with me. You were with him for four years, okay? You guys won. You went to three championships games, and you won two. I think you made the man. Yeah, the program really went in the toilet after I left after three years. Um, you know, it was interesting, Jack. Like, that was a, uh, a time in my life where, you know, you mentioned I've been drafted. 
Yeah, I was I was one of those guys. I was a, I was considered a great high school player. I was a good college player. I was a good role player. And uh, you know, you got drafted back when there were a million rounds in the NBA draft. But I did very well in uh, in training camp with the Dallas Mavericks. And you know, I felt like you know I'm good enough to make the NBA. But the truth is, you know, that my level was was in Europe. And I had two really good years in Italy, and then went to Spain. Uh, and then my last year in Spain, my third year, wasn't the best year because of the team I was playing on. But I wanted to keep playing because I was really enjoying, honestly, being a star player again. And uh, and I thought I would play 10 or 12 years over there and make a bunch of money and then move on to the next phase of my life. But Coach K called me. I had applied to Duke Law School at the urging of my father because my dad thought, if you're going to go to law school, you need to be ready to go at any time if you get injured or what, you know, if circumstances change in your basketball life. And if you wait until after you finish playing when you're in your 30s, you're not going to go. And, uh, and he was right. So I had applied to Duke Law School, and I think Coach Gay found out about it. And, uh, and he had called me over the summer and said, if, if you get admitted to law school, will you go? And I told him that I was, if I get in, I was thinking about deferring and continuing to play because I really wanted to play. And, uh, and he said, well, listen, here's what I want to do. I want to hire you as an assistant coach, and you go to law school at the same time. Uh, you'd be a graduate assistant, and I want you on my staff. And I, you know, I don't know this. I've never really asked him, but I think he was was you know sort of greasing the skids for me to get into law school, and uh, and so he he hired me on his staff so that it would be an easier sell to the university to admit me into law school. Uh, I don't know that as a fact, but I really believe that that's what happened. So I, I took it. I thought this is a good opportunity. So I took it, thought I would want to go into coaching, and uh, and it was a, a wonderful basketball education for me to be on his staff. And uh, and I got a lot of credit for juggling two things at once, but it really wasn't that hard after the first year, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was just a, a, a it was an honor and a pleasure, and uh, it's just a learning experience on on both sides of the coin with law school and with uh, with coaching. Uh, so I couldn't have asked for a better situation. And the reason was Coach K had the vision to do that. That was not me. That was him saying, here's the best thing for you, and here, and this is something you want to do, and here's how I can make it happen. And, uh, and so I give all the credit to him for that. That was all him. We're talking to Jay Billis, 1995, this fledgling sports company named ESPN hires him to do college basketball. When we come back, we're going to talk about that chapter in his life. And I'm Jack Rasool, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WGR. This is Anything is Possible. I'm your host, Jack Rasool. We're with Jay Billis, and since 1995... He's been a color commentator, studio analyst for ESPN College Basketball. Jay, describe for us the size of the team, the technology, the production of an ESPN collegiate basketball game in 1995 versus what it is today. Much bigger in 1995 because of the resource level. Uh, you know, in 1995, you had a truck at every game and, uh, and a full staff at every game. Now, because of technology, uh, you know, some of these uh, buildings are already hardwired. They have their own studio presence, their own control room. Uh, so the games look a little bit different, except on the, the biggest games, which, which I'm lucky to be involved in. Um, so they, they were bigger operations back then. Um, and uh, and you know, every game that you went to was, a, and still is, but not to the same level, was a huge event. And so for me, getting a start in that, I started in radio in 1993 and then, uh, and then got hired by ESPN in 95. Um, it was, you know, that sort of innocent climb in the business was perhaps the most fun uh, you could ever have. You know, once you've been in it, I've been in it for 27, 28 years now, 30 overall with, uh, from when I started uh, in radio. Uh, everything when it was new, it was you can't describe the level of excitement for it. And I, I have to remind myself now not to take for granted um, how exciting it still is. 
you know, walking into these arenas and working with the people I'm, I'm, you know, privileged to work with. Um, but when you do it for so long, sometimes you can, you know, you can think it's a routine deal and it's not. Uh, there are people who would uh, would kill to to be in the positions that so many of us are in now. That uh, I, I have to remind myself, hey man, don't take this for granted because you would have you would have committed felonies to get this opportunity 30 years ago, and, and it's true. I probably would have. For 30 years, you've worked with around a bald guy, blind in one eye, screaming "Awesome baby," diaper dandy trifecta. Dick Vitale, what makes him so unique? Probably the authenticity uh, of, of Dick. Um, he's a wonderful person, and, and he loves every part of, of being in the business and, and the game and those who are, uh, are in the game, and I think that shines through. Um, he's, a, uh, you know, he's a different personality, and I mean that in a positive way. Uh, there, there's nothing fake about Dick Vitale. He's, just, uh, he's fun to be around. Uh, and he's he's funny and uh, and has a great wit, uh, but he uh, you know he wears his emotions on his sleeve, and not everybody does that, uh, and, and not everybody should. You have to be your own person, but he's uh, he's authentic, and uh, he, he's definitely an American original. And I'm I'm lucky, you know, I'm lucky in so many ways. One that that he called my games when I was a player. And he's been the soundtrack to, to for the, those of a certain age to all of our careers. But then, uh, then I got to work with him, and uh, and and I get to call him a friend. So that's a that that's been an extraordinary blessing. Jerry Lewis, for I don't know thirty years, had the annual telethon, you know, for muscular dystrophy, and since Jimmy V died, Dick Vitale has been on a mission for the Jimmy V Foundation, et cetera. Talk about what Dick V, Dickie V has done for the Jim, cancer and the Jimmy V Foundation. Well, he's, he's thrown his energy, his considerable energy, into that. And, uh, and he is, he's a hard man to say no to. Uh, you know, he's got tremendous energy for, for the cause, and I think that shows through in everything that he does. But he's been instrumental in raising so much money and, and increasing awareness. And, uh, and I, I think getting people to feel uh, what the fight against cancer really is. I think any, anyone who's been involved in it, whether personally or with a family member or friend, uh, they can feel it. But for those who have been fortunate enough not to be so... Uh, viscerally affected by cancer yet, because everybody will be, I believe, at some point. Hopefully, not not, not in the future. After we uh, we make more gains, we, we've made incredible gains to this point. But uh, but Dick makes people feel it, and uh, and when they feel it, they want to get more involved. And so he he deserves a, a tremendous amount of credit for for all he's accomplished in that area. Many people say you were the driving force that pushed the collegiate athletes to fight for the transfer portal rights and NIL. Jay, explain the transfer portal to us. The transfer portal is just a mechanism that the NCAA devised where players, uh, uh, for years, players, when they transferred, one, they had to sit out a year in five sports. And it was only five. It was uh, uh, football, men's and women's basketball, hockey, and baseball. All those sports you could transfer and be eligible right away. But in the money sports, a lot of coaches and administrators complained about tampering, that somehow a player uh, had a landing spot before the, the coaches or administrators ever found out they even wanted to transfer. And so the, the, the deal was done before they knew about it. So they came up with this transfer portal. It is not ideal. Um, uh, I think it, it needs to be better regulated, um, and, and timing needs to be improved on decisions. Overall, the concept is laudable that, uh, that you give players an opportunity to move uh, when they choose because you know the NCAA has drawn a line. says they're not employees. They're students to be treated like any other student. And when the NCAA was fighting in court over money and compensation issues against athletes, they knew that the transfer restrictions and the transfer rules were making them look bad, so they made the change. It's extraordinarily difficult on coaches for roster management and retention of players. That, that's been frustrating, I know. 
but uh, um, it, it's just one of those things that the NCAA, is, as you know, Jack, uh, in in the middle here, there, there's transformation going on uh, that they don't want with regard to player player compensation, and they're trying. They're still trying to draw a line in the sand. Now they're drawing it instead of compensation because we've got you know name, image, and likeness rights now for players, which is just a small part of what they're worth in the marketplace, they're drawing the line saying they can't be employees. So they still have to be allowed to transfer. And, uh, and uh, you know, I know coaches don't like, a lot of coaches don't like, well, they should have to sit out a year. There should be some kind of restriction so that you don't have players leaving for, for a poor reason or just any reason they pull out of the sky. Um, I'm not sure that's, that's good policy, uh, the way the coaches want it. Because that strikes me as like a, uh, a non deep provision in an employment contract, and the NCAA says they're not employees. But uh, I think we'll find an equilibrium uh, at some point in the near future, and I think it's going to come through unless Congress steps in to provide some sort of federal law to preempt all the state laws in, in the NIL area. I, I think, Jack, in, in the future, the way this is going to be resolved, absent Congress stepping in, is is schools are just going to sign players to contracts. And so they'll make an offer to a player. The player either accepts the offer or not. They negotiate it at arm's length. And schools can have a buyout provision in the contract. So if a player leaves before the end of the term of the contract, that player will owe a, a buyout number. Uh there are so many ways where parties protect themselves and contracts can be negotiated, and that's where I think we'll wind up. We're talking to Jay Billis, affectionately known as the Billistrator, and I'm Jack Rasool, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. Jack Krizula, host of WJR's Anything is Possible, the weekly radio visit, brings his 15 years of inspirational storytelling to hardcover. With God, anything is possible. Anything is possible. 15 of Jack's more than 750 tales of defeating odds and achieving the extraordinary. Like Bob Woodruff, whose job covering the war in Iraq nearly cost him his life. And Nick Vujicic, the limbless evangelist who has stunned millions with his message of acceptance and grace. With God, anything is possible. Order now while signed copies are still available at trustinusllc.square.site. That's trustinusllc.square.site. And as Jack says, Make it a great week because with God, anything is possible. Spohol. I'm Jack Rasula. This is Anything is Possible. We're talking to Jay Billis, the most respected voice in college basketball today. Jay, let's talk about collegiate basketball coaches um, and about all the good that these high school and college coaches do for America's greatest natural resource, our young people. You know, Jack, the most influential people in my life have been coaches. And it's not that my teachers or professors have not been influential because they have been, but the most influential have been coaches. And I think most of the best coaches out there on, on every level understand down to their socks that what they say to, to their players day to day has tremendous impact. I remember everything my coaches said to me, positive and negative, and no one was more responsible for my confidence uh, both in raising it and lowering it than my coaches were. And, uh, and it's a tremendous responsibility. And while we tend to evaluate coaches on wins and losses, which in some instances is appropriate, really the, the, the greatest impact the coaches have is on, on the lives of their players off the court and off the field of play. Um, and I think one of the measures, and I'm sure Coach K, Tom Izzo, you know, all, all these great coaches would agree with this, that – one of the measures, I think, of, of your success as a coach is are you, uh, are you invited to your players' weddings and do you get announcements when they, their, their kids are born and things like that? Are you part of their lives? And, uh, and you know, to me, um, that, that's, the, that's the good stuff uh, are the relationships. And, and the, it's a relationship business. 
And uh, and I think I think the very best coaches realize that coaching is a noble profession. I really believe that. Um, we don't always treat it that way in, in our commentary because we get in the weeds of how many championships did this coach win. But I remember Coach K saying something to me uh, uh, back when I was an assistant. We were evaluating a team that we had coming up, and he talked about how good this coach was. And the team was, you know, the coach had a 500 record. And he said some of the best coaches that have ever coached this game have 500 records. Um, they haven't had access to the same kind of players. And, uh, and that really made an impact on me. All right. We met one night at the DAC. And there was a coach by the name of Tom Izzo who once said to me that a college coach is as much a team